Disruptors and Curious Minds, welcome to another amazing episode of Thinking on Paper. My name's Jeremy. This is Mark. It's the best day of the week. It's Thursday. It's 1030 Eastern. We get to unpack the intersection between culture and emerging tech with the founders. These guys are actually defining new ways we're going to be doing things in the future. I'm super excited to be here. Mark is fresh off of quantum computing panels at Vivitech. Mark, tell me about your experience there real quick before we jump I, in. Before that, though, I'm going to stick on this one because the the global logistics business is worth trillions. I think like eight or nine, ten trillion. Who knows? I think that if unless you live off the grid in, in North Wales or you're one of the few communities in the world that's not connected, it impacts your life. Everything gets delivered, freight, shipping. It's touches it touches everything in that we experience in our lives and to, to to speak to todd today about how technology is going to change that i'm very excited about it and as for a question on paris it was awesome and i got some very good quantum guests lined up for the our quantum season but let's not get ahead of ourselves i love it i love it well glad you're back and uh yeah this is a really interesting topic just basically that uh, this is this is how things are coordinated, right? Yeah. How things are coordinated and organized. And there are better ways to do things by getting people within the ecosystem that you're trying to organize to add value to that ecosystem. And you can actually reward them for adding value to that ecosystem. So I think that's the conversation that we're going to have today. First of all, um, thanks to our amazing friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E. Ripple is marketing's on-demand talent platform. So Ray Samuels and, and the crew over there have been amazing supporters of our show for a really long time. They do great things in organizing interdisciplinary talent and point them to your projects, whether it's a year long, whether it's two years, whether it's three weeks, whether it's four disciplines or one discipline, they're amazing. Please check them out. And uh, yeah, W-R-I-P-P-L-E. Without further ado, Mark, let's bring on our guests to give me a little intro and we'll pop them on the screen. Yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, Todd Halehurst is the CEO and founder of Heal, the, the unified API for logistics platform. Welcome to the show, Todd. It's great to have you here. And we're going to get into you and Heal. I'm going to unpack all of that great stuff. But I'm thinking on paper, we like to thread our episodes together, don't we, Jeremy? So we're going to yeah. start with the last question from the last show, which was posed to you by the CEO of Steppen. So that's what we do. So everyone leaves a question for the next guest. And her question for you, before we get into Todd and here was, how do we bring more people into Web3? What's the secret magic ingredient that we're missing to get more people to, to look at the space? Yeah, great question. So thank you guys for, for having me. Pleasure to be here. Um, Really, I think the, the best way to get more users into the space is ultimately to create usable applications and usable technology. And uh, we got to beat them where, where they're at, right? So we got to create applications that are easy for them to use that, that um, you know, feels and looks and feels a lot like what they're used to today. Indeed. indeed. Case in point, we, we just shared a... Uh... Todd and I just shared a, an analogy that both of us tend to use that, you know, is email. People don't care about the behind the scenes stuff that, you know, how the tech works, how it all works. We can type in a message and press send and it goes from Atlanta to Iceland. It's amazing. So we need to get in that mindset. I think one other thing I want to, I want, I want to add to, we were talking about for my friends listening from Simsbury, Connecticut. Um, Todd is Todd's first name and his company's name is Healy. And Simsbury friends, if you remember, Todd Healy was the leader of a band called Uncle Gabe in Connecticut that uh, were studs. So off we go in serendipity land. Todd, how did you get into this world of logistics and try to reinvent it? Like where did where did all this where did these paths cross and how did you get started? Yeah, so actually, um, my whole life has been in and around logistics. Um, my dad worked at a, at a warehouse on a dock loading and unloading trucks, doing, you know, receiving shipments. Um, my best friend's dad growing up, he was a freight broker. Um, so I've always been in and around the space. And then when I got to college, my first job was with a moving company and um, ended up getting a degree in economics and game theory. Um, left college, helped a friend start a freight brokerage, got back into the moving space on the brokerage side, and then got into the technology space and 2011 
Um, and at that same time, I was looking at Bitcoin. I was at the time it was Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Purecoin were number one, two, and three. So those kind of those paths kind of diverged um, at the same time with my interest in technology. Purecoin, wow. <laughs> yeah, pure Purecoin. That way back in the day, this was before Ethereum. Amazing! Why wow. you had me at game theory, Todd? Yes. Um, t- talk to me about how how um, how that sparked your curiosity and and how that unfold how that folds into what you're doing. Is that is that any carryover, or was that just a, an interest that you landed on? Well, could we even maybe have a, a brief explanation of game theory for our non game theorists? Sure. Um, I would say it, game theory is kind of a broad category, but I would say it it's the science of decision making and and um, uh, creating games that optimize for the best outcome. So in the context of this, you know, that that's how I see the world. I see the world through the lens of how do we optimize for the best outcome and how do we, um, how do we solve against the worst outcome? So it's, yeah, games, games are experiences, right? Game, these experiences turn into how people interface with products and systems and all of that kind of stuff. Right. So that, that probably fed into how you're building this, uh, or have you built this, this wonderful product? So, um, let's root in since your history is deep in, in, uh, logistics and that sort of thing. What, what's the current state of the industry right now? I mean, we're, we're, we're in a situation where I can pull up my iPhone and order something and it, it basically gets to me before I ordered it. Right. Like, so what what are we what are we seeing? What's the current state right now? What's important to the people that are doing the shipping? What's important to the people that are doing the buying? Yeah. So when people think of shipping, they mostly think of parcel and they think of, hey, I go to Amazon and I click a button and within a couple hours, my my thing is delivered to my doorstep. And um, that's the that's the last mile piece. So in the last 10 years, the the industry has done two things. Primarily, it's it's undergone a technology revolution from one perspective. And then on the, uh, from another perspective, that last mile piece has, has really gotten solidified and, and optimized to where now you can get a package, you know, in, in, in a couple hours. So, um, Amazon has really done a great job of, of really optimizing that last mile pickup and delivery piece. There's been a lot of work that's been done on the fulfillment side, last mile pickup and delivery. Um, but really the middle mile is still a, a complete mess. And when I say a middle mile, um, what I'm referring to is that if you think about, you have last mile, so you have all these distribution centers in these cities, goods will move into these distribution centers and they'll, they'll pick and pack from these centers to be able to, uh, have them delivered to your house within a couple hours. So middle mile is you know going from city to city it could be a truckload it could be less than truckload um you could it could be ocean it could be you know maritime so um that component is still highly fragmented and and part of the reason for that fragmentation is because there's there's a 80 percent of the industry is small fleet owner operators one to five trucks so behind the scenes FedEx, UPS, DHL, they all use a network of independent contractors and owner operators to do all the middle mile shipping. So what we're primarily focused on at Healy is, is creating a, a data management platform that connects all those different systems together that those companies use to unify that into a single format and then tokenize that data to create a master record. So no matter how many parties or who is interacting with a particular shipment, everybody's using the same information and on the same page and therefore solving the coordination issue that exists again, primarily at that middle mile, uh, layer. Is, is there a general consensus on th- this is the root issue and this is, this is the root problem is, and so f- you see, you mentioned this kind of hierarchy of companies where you need the big global companies to work with the smaller fleets of five tech. Is everyone on the same page? Like, is everyone open to this particular solution? Yeah. So there's a general consensus in logistics that, uh, data is a, is a big problem and the data is siloed in all these different systems. 
And there's a bit of a perverse incentive where uh, currently the, the, the market rewards obfuscation, or at the very least, it doesn't reward transparency. So on one side, you have the shippers that are trying to push for transparency and they're saying, hey, we want transparency into what's going on with our shipments. And on the other end, there's no clear incentive for, for carriers to provide the transparency that they want. In addition to that, uh, without the use of decentralized technology, um, carriers are losing control of their data, they're losing ownership of their data. And for them, that's a big competitive moat because that's how they that's how they operate. That's that's the that's the lifeblood of of their business, and so they don't want to disclose this information um, to to you know for for no reason. So with Healy, we're rewarding them for providing that data for being transparent with and doing so in a way where they don't lose ownership and control of that data. And in addition to that the network will provide them with additional means of monetizing that data, which is the, you know, I think the hope and promise of Web3. Could we could we unpack a little bit more about why someone wouldn't want to provide that data? Yeah, so it's a very competitive industry and they don't want their competitors knowing how they're pricing and because then people can undercut and undercut and undercut. So... I mean, that's that's the primary reason that they don't want to, they're reluctant to share that data. So is it the data? data the sorry, data, Mark, go ahead. Sorry, no, it, like the data is valuable. So in order to to remove that friction, you need to make something that's more valuable than the value of the data. They're in nice game theory, right? So you have to make the... I'm a poker you know, player. Like that's where my game theory stops. <laughs> yeah. You, you, uh, you have to change the economics to make it more rewarding or incentivize them to share the data because if they're making more money by sharing the data and being transparent they're going to do so and so the, also be able to maintain co their competitive advantage within a broader network without exposing that data to their competitors or others who could use it against them so that so i i understand the data in like it, so if mark ships something and you know, I'm it's the like guy. Pineapples. That... I'm shipping pineapples. Well, yeah, we'll unpack that choice in a minute. That's very interesting. <laughs> but all right, so so Mark, uh, Mark ships. I buy pineapples from Mark, and Todd is the guy in the middle that's going to somehow get the pineapples from Mark to me. The valuable information for me and Mark is where are the pineapples after they leave Mark's warehouse and before they get to my spot. The pricing yeah. information necessarily isn't important to me well when i buy it but like to to the network it, it doesn't seem to be as important how does the like the cost of shipping how does that data come into come into play yeah so in the so there's three primary components you have pre-transit in transit and post-transit so in pre-transit pricing is is the is a key component because carriers are competing competing to try to get that business right um so that that happens at the at the front end and then it, in transit then you want to know where your shipment's at and currently the data is available to be able to provide that level of of um, transparency but carriers don't want to share it because then there's a likelihood of a shipper calling them you know every 30 minutes saying hey um i saw the truck turn towards mexico what's going on is is my ship being stolen is it going out of the country you know there's there's it opens up things like that. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's it's nonlinear in, in how a shipment is actually moved from one place to another. And if you're not experienced with it, you may not know. Uh, but that data is valuable to the shipper because on the other side, they're they're looking at that saying, I have to prepare my docks in order to receive this shipment in a timely fashion, which also helps the carrier, right? Because they're not sitting there you know, if, if the dock is poorly managed, they're not sitting there waiting, uh, or sorry, if it's poorly managed, they're sitting there waiting, spending drivable hours to try to get that shipment unloaded from their truck. And so um, uh, that data is available. For us, we want to incentivize that with the use of our reward token to be able to generate that data and share that data to provide them with uh, an additional stream of, of 
revenue ultimately, make it more valuable to share that data, despite additional headaches it may it may create uh, from a certain perspective. So a lot of times what will happen right now is that the feed is available, but the, the driver or the carrier will, will shut it down and not expose access to it. And then they'll manage everything through phone calls, emails, and text. That makes sense. So like give it, yeah. So they're giving, they think of it as giving away their secret sauce a little bit where by giving away a little bit of that sauce, the whole system becomes better. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's because I, I, I mentioned, I actually shipping pineapples, Jeremy, because I was actually, I was, I, I was in the supermarket just a couple of days ago and I bought a pineapple and my wife says, uh, you probably shouldn't be, shouldn't be in pineapples up a mountain in, in the middle of, in the beginning of spring. But I was like, it's like, it was amazing. And I, I always think, how did this get here so quickly? Like how many steps were involved? And then before the show, I mean, I don't know anything about logistics and this is fascinating for me to hear this, but how, how much waste, how much waste, how many wasted hours, how many wasted trips, how many wasted man hours will this save? I mean, I can't imagine how much that waste there is in the global shipping and freight industry. It just mind, yeah. it's almost as mind boggling as eating a pineapple in the mountains in winter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, so uh, when we ran our calculations, we looked at all the different components. We calculated 268 billion of errors, theft, fraud, and waste, which are the primary, those are the four primary things that our network solves for. Um, but there's other calculations out there that's as high as 600 billion. So it's a huge problem that everybody has all around the world. And that's not even accounting for uh, waste from the perspective of this shipment, uh, this, this, these apples went bad, or that's not even accounting for th situations like that, where food goes bad or spoils in transit. On, on that, I was speaking to someone who, who runs a company in France, who's trying to solve or, or trying to help with the, the food waste. And just in France, only, only, it was like 14 billion euros per year is wasted on restaurant food waste alone and like, like anything that can make that system run smoother it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's literally cultural defining it changes everything yeah yeah fundamentally we actually have we don't we don't have a resource problem we have a resource allocation problem and it's very inefficient to get the resources into the hands of the right people when they need it and so um I would say that most of our problems could be solved by better systems for resource management and allocation. So a lot of decisions, you know, to, to participate in a, in a network or an ecosystem are, are based on trust, right? It's a human factor, mm -hmm. you know, and that extends through business and, and all of that, obviously. So I think of it, I love the, the idea of this unified API. It makes a ton of sense, you know, rewarding and incentivizing people as well. How do you become, how do you build trust with these big entities and these small entities to kind of say, hey, I'm going to do all of this stuff right. Here's how we do it. Yeah, we, we shift the narrative from I to we, right? Because hmm. uh, this is an open ecosystem and it's something that we collectively are doing together. So, um, if you look at the problem, the, the problem of data and creating a single source of truth, you could do that with a, with web two technology. The problem that you run into is now you create a, a third party that is a trusted entity. And that's a number one, that's a lot of data and that's a lot of power. And so, um, people are reluctant to share and put their data into, um, into technology that or they'll lose control or they'll lose ownership of their data because then it can be used, you know, sold, monetized, used against them. There's all sorts of things that can happen with that data. So when we talk to the people in the industry, we talk about community, we talk about open, we talk about decentralized, we talk about these things that there's a lot of education involved in because it's outside the scope of what they're currently used to. Um, but boiling it down to say, look, you, you maintain control 
of your data. You maintain ownership of your data. It's actually more secure because it's encrypted end to end and it accomplishes, uh, it, it, it uh, solves a lot of your coordination issues and provides you with uh, rewards for, you know, you and the counterparty in the transaction rewards for things that are ultimately beneficial to streamlining that, that shipment and also streamlining the settlement process that happens in that post transit phase, which is, which is good for good for everyone. Right. Totally agree. So super interesting. So here's, here's my, I always go to like, my brain always tries to get to practical examples. So let's go back. Mark, Mark is not the shipper of pineapples. Mark and Jeremy both have two businesses. We're kind of middle to last mile kind of coordinators. I've got a fleet of about five trucks. Mark's got six wagons that he pedals behind mountain bikes. And, uh, and we're part of this network and I'm intrigued. I ran across you, Todd, and I'm like, man, if I give my data into this network, it'll help me become more efficient. And I also get some reward for that. But I'm a little nervous because Mark's my competitor. And like, what if he sees, you know, what what my costs are, what my routes are, what my, you know, Todd, how do you help me get my head around that? Yeah, so you, your data is your data. And the data is obfuscated until you provide someone permission to access your data. So there's no scenario in which Mark could see your your data or he could see your your data or vice versa. You could see his data, right? Uh, unless you were going to do business together, then you could share your data with him and you could share specific data with him relating to the transactions. So we use uh, zero knowledge proofs to, to make yes. sure. <laughs> yeah. Mark, is, Mark is a ZK dude. I'm not, I'm not a ZK. We had, we had a, 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 the founder of Z, Z, ZK link on a couple of weeks ago. And he yeah. was, we're kind of fascinated by what ZK knowledge can, zero knowledge can do. And sorry, I interrupted yeah. you because I'm very excited. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> that that's a perfect scenario, right? That's that's the that's the scenario that this technology can really solve. I think it's a it's a key use case for that. It's actually it's actually pretty amazing. So it, I'm I'm thinking you know, with my I'm just a shipper. I'm I'm a, I'm a guy that just puts stuff on trucks and gets it from one point to another. Given back to our practical example, and so what you're saying, Todd, my data is used to make the overall system better um, fed into creating knowledge in the overall system, but Mark doesn't necessarily see the granularity of how I do my business. Yeah, exactly. Unless Mark gets your private keys or you share the data with him, then, um, or you share the data with him directly, then he doesn't get access to your data. It's it's in the messaging, is it? It's in the storytelling because I think, and perhaps shipping and freight is old school i don't i don't know if that's the right description for it but the people who run yeah. these companies are they're they're a bit thinking on paper they, they they're old old school they use ledgers they use pens they use pencils they use paper they share notes and maybe mm -hmm. the, the 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 storytelling narrative part of that to encourage them that they don't that they can leave these things behind and try a new system which will eventually make them more profitable is the way to really change opinions on are yeah. they fearful of tech then are they, is there fear in are you met, meeting fear so we're partnering with uh technology providers in the space primarily and plugging into the transportation management systems that these companies use already um so for them they're not they don't really have to overhaul or change any of their operations or their business. Uh, they're just, we're just plugging into their existing technology and creating a common layer between common data layer between their technology and who they use and all the other technologies that are out there. Okay. It's, I, I think it's super compelling. So, all right. So let's say, let's say we get, you know, this, this system, you know, gets rocking and rolling. The 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 middle layer folks are figuring stuff out. What what's the grand goal? I mean, are we are we are we knocking on like FedEx and, and UPS and kind of saying, "Hey guys, I it's got Mer this thing Mersk, Is it? Are we knocking on their door? Yeah, right. Like, talk, where where are we pointing? Like a few years down the road, if all goes well. Yeah. So 
really we're running the same playbook that all the L1s and L2s are running, which is that we're building out this network, that we're building out this ecosystem. We're have, we're setting aside funds for application development, for integrations, for mergers and acquisitions, and things that will ultimately provide, will ultimately increase transaction volume on the network and attract new shippers, freight brokers, and forwarders and carriers to the network. So our end game is really just to provide this network, this open ecosystem for people to integrate their existing applications or build new applications on top of this common data infrastructure for logistics. And so that's our main focus. And whoever wants to plug in and play and, and build applications and integrate, then happy to have them, you know, on, on the network. And you're, you're, th what you're delivering with this, with this open AI is great because it's demonstrating, you know, Hey, we're a community. We're not trying to be this new walled off siloed solution that requires yeah. paid access. And you know, you can only jump in if you give us a hundred dollars a month kind of thing. It's more of a, you know, Hey, let's open this thing up. Um, what are you hearing from the market? What are you hearing from people when they, when they get a, they get, you know, some value back in return for helping out with some information? Yeah, so it's primarily an education process for us because it's it's very new and it's very novel and something that you know you're you're explaining things that have never been possible in logistics, um, and so there's a bit of an education process involved. But pretty you know pretty much everybody we've talked to, um, they want to be a part of it. It's just a matter of figuring out how they can be a part, of it, figuring out timing, but. To a large extent, it's a, it's an education process, and you know, podcasts like this help us create the content, provide the material that that we can then share with other people, and uh, help bring them up to speed and and um, get their minds, you know, thinking about okay, what can I do with this technology? How can I improve my business? How can I how can I be a better you know community member? How can I contribute? And how can we? Uh, you know, build this, this, uh, deep end logistics network. Okay. okay. Now it's my turn, Jeremy. So I, <laughs> I, I'm not getting involved in this. You and Todd, you are both using Healy. You're, you've, you've incorporated the system into your existing tech stack. I've refused for whatever reason. What I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a family run business. I don't have got 20 trucks, but what would I see happening between you two that I wouldn't, have access to and can the system get better with just a few points using this tech what like what happens to the surrounding yeah. logistics ecosystem that's not using the api yeah so if you think about it we're solving the coordination issue so the coordination issue those who solve the coordination issue will be more efficient than those who have not solved the coordination issue so there's an incentive there for them to to solve the coordination issue and by joining the network. In addition to that, you're now you're also making you're also getting rewards from the network for being on the network. So now you're more profitable, which means that you can either lower your prices and be more competitive if you want, or you're just making more more money, being more profitable, and you can grow and expand your business and take up more and more of the market share. So just like any technology, those who adopt efficiencies are going to be more competitive and therefore will get a larger, larger piece of the market. Yeah. So I think w within the network, you know, just from my perspective, answering that question in our little continued thought experiment, the idea that, you know, I'm probably more, I'm probably easier to work with for those that are within yeah. this, this Healy ecosystem and network, um, you know, so it also depends the value of being in the network, just like network effects and all that kind of stuff is how many people are in the network and are using the network. And that just increases over mm -hmm. time. And then, you know, Mark and his mountain bikes and wagons uh, eventually get get left to the wayside. <laughs> right. He's still working with horse and buggy, you know, but I, I'm delivering it by hand. I'm growing it in my garden and I'm de delivering it by hand i had a question you've like completely thrown me off jeremy what was i gonna say um it's my job yeah. <laughs> good one uh you go ahead while i try and remember what it was yeah i it, so all right I, I know this is going to be a difficult question to answer and you know let but let's just play around with it for a second so mm. 
you know, let's let's say I've got five trucks. Um, I keep those five trucks, you know, 80% utilized. I'm doing pretty well. I'm not sure what other logistical, like what the mechanics are to evaluate profitability and success. But let's just say I've got five trucks. They're 85% utilized. Um, if I decide to kind of freely send any and all information into the Healy network, like, is it, I mean, I know we got to be careful about like saying what actual money exchanges hands, but is it like, is it, would it be a meaningful, like receipt on my side? If, if I, if I put all my information into this network? Yeah. So if you think about, you put your money and your data in the network, there's some sort of, um, impact that that will have on the network from a monetary perspective. Um, there's a demand for that data. Um, and so against a fixed supply, that's going to ultimately provide you back some sort of reward or some return, you know, for contrib for, for, for contributing that to the network. Um, and that has an amplification effect, right? So the more and more transactions that they put into the network, the more these people participate in the network, the more valuable the network becomes in general. And again, tough, qu tough question to ask. Like, I know we don't want to like say, yeah, I'm going to get $10,000 for doing this. Like, but it's, but it's one of those things. It sounds like more, you know, it's, it's a, it, there'd be a nice little flow coming in. It's not going to be game changing and turn your business from not profitable to profitable, but there'll be something coming in on top of this tremendous value that you get for contributing to this information that you actually are going to benefit from and make your business more efficient as well. Is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we've, we've done some, uh, use cases and in the use cases and the, some of the value modeling we did, it was a 1.9% increase to your bottom line. Um, and this is in an industry that averages two to 6%. So fairly significant increase. Yeah. It's massive. Yeah. On, on that scale. Um, so I think, so people who are, are not in, into blockchain and logistics and we're in the midst of a cost of living crisis, anything mm -hmm. which is going to lower the end price for the consumer or potentially lower the end price for the consumer for the, the everyday person is something to be embraced with open arms is it not mm -hmm. i think it is and I'm very excited about that do you mind if i show my a, a prime example of how a little knowledge is a dangerous thing because i'm gonna do i'm gonna try, I'm gonna try this i was listening to a podcast bizarrely about the logistics of japanese tuna a while ago and it was about the arbitrage of seafood and how there's a multi-billion dollar business on the arbitrage of fresh fish essentially essentially people buying it on the docks knocking up yeah. the will this does this change that at all does it change the arbitrage business of logistics or does it not I think in any market, when you have better data, it creates better price discovery and better price discovery mechanisms ultimately create more efficiency and a, and a better uh, market that's more competitive. So I think from that perspective, it, it could have uh, impacts uh, from that perspective. I'm so glad that question kind of made sense. <laughs> well done, man. Well done. Yeah. So here's, here's, Tuna here's the awesome. arbitrage. This, so Todd, this is really cool. We got it. We got a heck of a lot of people watching us in, in real time right now. So I'd love to you know reach out and encourage anyone listening right now to pop a question in the chat for Todd. This is, this is definitely, you know, something that I look at as a really interesting application of this technology. You see a lot of, you know, web three type projects coming out that are just like, Oh, maybe they're just testing the coolness of how the tech works. Maybe it's maybe it's not a really you know good project, but this is a really great application to an existing industry. So pop your questions in the chat. We'd love to we'd love to answer them or help uh, add clarification from someone who's been in the, the logistics industry all their life as well. So there's this so there's a real knowledge of what's broken or what's not working or what could work better in the system. And yeah, to see the technology being used is a uh, is groundbreaking deep in todd deep in so i've seen i've seen deep in floating around 
Okay. We, we, talk to us about Deepin in, in, through the lens of logistics. Well, what, yeah. what does Deepin mean for our audience, those who don't know? I don't know. Yeah, so I think initially Deepin was put in the category of, I'm going to create a network and offer a service on top of that network, and I'm going to distribute hardware in order for you know regular consumers to be able to provide a service that then can be consumed by, um, you know, a, an end user, right? So if you think about in general, in, ec- in, an, in a market, you have producers and consumers. And so you're producing a good. And then on the other side, somebody's consuming a good. So DPEN is the, is, is a, I guess, a methodology of leveraging tokenomics to create incentives for people to bootstrap the creation of a network. If you use Helium as an example, bootstrapped a network of nodes to provide telecom infrastructure for, you know, transferring IoT data and also 5G and, um, and then providing a service to consumers of, of those uh, resources. So it, I would argue, is a more efficient mechanism for providing resources to people. In the context of what Healy is doing, uh, we, we like to refer to it as TIDEN, which stands for Token Incentivized Data Infrastructure Network, which is which means that the systems are already there, the hardware is already there. We're just plugging into them and we're, we're, um, we're getting them, we're incentivizing them to use our data infrastructure to perform their services that they offer in that particular industry. And in this case, logistics. So when you think about it from that perspective, we're giving, we're not just giving rewards to the supply side for creating the supply of a resource that the network consumed, we're actually giving it to the demand side and the supply side, and we're incentivizing specific behaviors that create value for the overall network by streamlining the shipment and making the process and uh, of uh, shipping something a lot faster, easier, and more efficient. So um, that's kind of the uh, we we are in the camp of DPEN, which DPEN is becoming a very broad category. Uh, and so we're kind of carving out our niche in what we're calling tied in, um, creating a, a, a really it's bringing the thought process of how do we create network effect by incentivizing demand side and supply side of a market to use specific data infrastructure that will ultimately make that industry more efficient and make those in that industry more efficient and profitable. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, the, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot we could go into there, but that's kind of high level. Decentralized physical infrastructure. If anyone's listening and they want to have, take this conversation further, email hello at thinking on paper X, Y, Z, and we'll have a, a conversation about deep in with you for sure. Yeah, what, so where I where, where I go to this too that that's really fun that technology is out there to to potentially coordinate an incentives program and strategy. Um, I, I used to write like right when DAOs first, the idea of DAOs first came out, you know, two three years ago, whatever it is. I ended up writing a column once a week on you know DAOs, but from like a people perspective, like what does this mean to be able to coordinate, organize, and that sort of thing. And I always go back to the idea of, you know, within a network, within a community, if you can, A, identify the superpower of the individual in that community and make that superpower known and then incentivize and reward that superpower to benefit the growth of the community, that's pretty wicked, man. Um, mm-hmm. So what, so taking this a step further, Todd, how far out could you expand the value that people in the network could could bring in. You talked about supply side. You talked about demand side. What about the user side? Like, what could the users do to to be more valuable to help your your network become more valuable? As someone who just orders something, right? Is that even possible? Yeah. So we're we've in the beginning we primarily focused on B two B and solving the problem from a B two B perspective. Uh, but there are avenues and ways for people to 
contribute to the community. One is helping educate people, creating content around, you know, what what this is and the meaningful impact that this can have, not only in the Web3 community, but in the in the world at large. In addition, there's so many opportunities for new people to come into the market to say, hey, if I leverage this technology, I can actually become more efficient than anybody in logistics. So I want to start a freight brokerage. I want to start a freight forwarding company. I want to start a carrier and I want to compete against, uh, I want to compete in this new market that's going to offer me a competitive advantage over others who are not using this infrastructure. So um, there's ways for people to run businesses. There's ways for people to um, you know, one, one thing that we're, we're looking at is creating various different tokenized assets within the space. So you have tokenizing of assets, you, let's say you're tokenizing, a a, a, a freight broker or a freight forwarder or a carrier, or even their equipment. There's ways in which you can create token schemas and, and asset, uh, real world assets to securitize some of those those uh, technologies to securitize some of those companies, leveraging the underlying technology, making them more efficient and arbitraging uh, that efficiency. So, so on top of that, that's, that's really interesting. So on top of that, like I'm just thinking about the value of this network to the people that are putting information in and out of it as, as shippers, as middle mile people, as last mile people, but Mm -hmm. there's the value of the data that, and the information that is generated out of the system that people could use to build businesses on maybe a route optimization technology or something uh, on top of that. So do you see eventually providing access to that data to, um, you know, people outside of that are just shipping or is that, is that a, is that a play in this? Yeah. So we, we want to create the infrastructure to allow for people to voluntarily put their data into a data union and ultimately create a data economy where uh, if you think about, you know, traders or supply chain planning, uh, cities and governments, you know, they all have a need to understand what is the, what is, what's the demand for specific goods and services within a particular uh, city, state, or even federal uh, government. So there's there's many different layers in which that data can be used. Um, one of the one one that I thought was kind of cool is when the maritime industry started uh, posting when they started publishing what commodities were moving around uh, on international waters that people would actually take that data and they would trade commodities based off of that data. And that, that was something I, I thought, I was like, wow, that's fascinating. It's a, it's a really good use case for that data where somebody can pay to say, okay, what is, what's selling in these local economies? What's moving in and out of these local economies? Uh, and how can I find ways to arbitrage that data, you know, for trading or for futures or for any, any um, financialization? So um, there's many things that will be, people will be able to do with it. And we're just focusing on creating that rich foundation through the data infrastructure that allows the people that are generating the data to voluntarily put that data anonymously into, into a data union that can then turn into uh, more profit for them ultimately. Amazing. Big time. I love it. I immediately, when you started talking about futures and stuff, this is dating myself, but I go to, you know, Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy and trading places and pork belly futures and orange juice. (laughs) But, uh, outside of that, uh, rabbit hole, what, um, this has been a fascinating conversation, man. I, I, I really has been fascinating. And I hope that, I mean, it's not something we'd normally speak about. It's absolutely fascinating to to hear it and to, to actually, we, we talk a lot about incentives, don't we? And the, the, the real world and how, Technology often faces the problem of changing existing systems because the money isn't there and the finances isn't there. The way that it works doesn't compute, and this this does. Yeah. What? Yeah, you got to create the middle layer between old systems and new systems uh, that translates the data, normalizes the data, and um, 
you know, is the connective tissue that creates that master record that new technology can be built on top of. Man, I, t I tell you what, I immediately think of, and this is, we're going to shamelessly plug our Thinking on Paper book club, but we read a, we read a book called uh, The Nexus by Julio Otino, and he talks about in that book, it's the convergence of art, tech, and science, but the, the idea that new systems, new technology has to be grounded, has to be rooted in the systems that, that it aims to change. So I'd, spot on, Julio would be very excited and proud to hear you say that. Um <laughs> So being my, being mindful of time, Todd, um, what what last few things would you like our audience to know about where you're headed specifically, say in the next like six months, what are the important things happening at Healy? Yeah, so we we just launched our MVP on the test on testnet. So we've got shipments that we're currently running through it. Uh, we're planning on launching our network and token in Q3 of 2024 this year going live on the mainnet. Um, so feel free to, to join our, our channels at community at, on Telegram, uh, at Healy Network on Twitter, engage in the conversation, you know, come, come join the, join the party, join the movement, and we'll build some really cool things together. So we're, we're very excited about the technology and the prospects of it, but it ultimately requires a community to get behind it and to support it. And the more that the Web3 community adopts and embraces this technology, the more we'll be able to get the logistics industry to adopt and embrace this technology as well, because those two relationships are symbiotic with each other. And currently, logistics is here, Web3 is here. What we're doing is we're blending and merging those two things together to create ultimately uh, a, a, a real world use case in a $9 trillion industry that we can bring on chain. Amazing. And Hey, you know, logistics folks that are, that happen to be listening to this, you know, if you're in the shipping industry or at least tangential or adjacent to it, what a, what an interesting way to check and test and pilot a meaningful use of, of this emerging tech that we're all seeing and hearing different things, good things and bad things about, um, mm -hmm. be a fun, be a fun way to kind of check it out. And, you know, the big, the big thing that I got out of this, you know, in our little example of me and my five trucks and Mark and his mountain bikes and wagons is, um, pineapples. That, pineapples is that Mark, you know, Mark won't see my proprietary data and information on how I do my business, how I do my work, but the network will benefit from that information, uh, overall efficiency. So I think, I think it's great. Um, last thing that we have that we would love to have you leave for our next guest. What about a question for our next, who is our next guest, Mark? And, yeah, and that uh, might we're, frame it. We're quite, it's like almost it's a very, actually, it's a, a logical continuation perhaps of this show. Um, we've got Tyler Adams, who's the CEO of NEO, which is a, another blockchain that's using the technology for real world business use cases. It's, it's more about design and fashion, but I think it's a, con, a good continuation. So yeah, question for him. It, it can be about anything you like, Todd. It can be about it can be about the blockchain, Web3. It can be about your industry. It can be about life. <laughs> so I, my question is ultimately, uh, how, do we, how do we create real world applications that impact the real world in a meaningful and positive way? And how do we use this technology? In, in the, how do we create uh, an ethos where that's the point? Todd Hazelhorst with Healy. Ed, thank you for joining us. This has been amazing. Um, you know, definitely we'll push out some notes where people can find yeah. you and stay updated. Thanks again to Ripple, W R I P P L E dot com, marketing's on demand talent platform. A lot of times, you know, we uh, are running lean and mean ships, us entrepreneurs, uh, even the big companies, right? So if you need to lean on uh, a great group of vetted solopreneurs, over 3,000 of them that go through a significant vetting process, uh, Mark and I both actually went through that vetting process. We are vetted. If you want to if you want to work with us, you can work with us too. But Ripple's amazing, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Mark, quick shout out about the book club. We read books. We reading, read books. Reading is now a team sport. What are we yeah. reading right now? We're reading, well, we're trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense, The Ooh. Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli, but thinking on paper.xyz, our YouTube channel, essentially we we dig under the, read between the lines and try and get the, the inside the strategy from books which have stood the test of time, which will change your mind. Join us. Amazing. Thinking on paper.xyz. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Be curious, stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. <laughs>